But we're in, in uh, Hosea. You may want to turn over there. Before we begin, though, let's have a word of prayer. Just bow with me, please. Heavenly and Father, we pray, pray that we will bless this study of thy word, that we may ascertain thy will for us, and may we have a determination to do thy will come what may. And we're grateful that thou hast left for us this light divine, that which we call the Holy Bible, for it is such. And we pray that we may ever be students of it and proclaimers of the truth therein. We pray that keep us in thy care as we go through this study, and may we all be enlightened as a result of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now one of the first things that uh, we need to clarify is, how do you actually pronounce this word? You know, most of us will say Hosea. And if you're talking about uh, Spanish, of course it would be Hosea, the H would be silent. But in English, the proper pronunciation is Hosea. But we typically don't do that. So if you want to say Hosea, I'll say Hosea. And we'll all know what we're talking about, hopefully. And we know very little about uh, Hosea, where he came from, or what have you. Kind of think that he was probably the way he writes and so forth, and he's probably from the uh, northern kingdom, Israel, Samaria. He's probably there, and the way he writes about priest, he may have been a priest. Don't know that. Just uh, speculation, and it, based on uh, the things that he says, especially the kings that he names, it's thought that he wrote somewhere around the same time as Amos, but after Amos. Uh, and Amos and he could not be more different. Amos was a very stern individual, given his background, of course. That's a lot different than what we think Hosea was. But very stern, whereas uh, Hosea was not. He was much more, if you want to call it emotional, he was much more uh, given to loving kindness and what have you, whereas Amos, he just told it like it was. You know, that's kind of where he kind of came from. But all these things uh, happen in uh, a time of, there's a political context in which all these things happen. And I've always said that uh, you know, the scary thing about the prophets is you can see the same things happening today. And if God rendered judgment on those people for the things they did at that time, why would he not render judgment upon us for the things that we're doing now? So, uh, of course, you know, we know from Amos that Israel was very much in a state of moral decline, apostasy, uh, idol worship, what have you. And if you want to make a uh, comparison to the United States today, you have a lot of material to work with. But let's look at the political. I want you to read. I want to read this excerpt from uh, Homer Haley about the political uh, context of the day. And. You know, one would kind of go, come away scratching their head about, you know, what's, what's going on here? It says the period of Hosea's prophesying was one of political upheaval in the United States, I mean, uh, Israel. Upon the death of Jeroboam, his son Zechariah reigned for only six months. This is Jeroboam the second, by the way, not the first. Uh, being unable to maintain his throne for, for a long period, he, he was killed after six months. Uh, he was the thing's looking at me in 
Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, his son, Zachariah, reigned on for six months, and he, of course he was killed. Been unable to maintain his throne for a longer period. He was slain by Shalom, who reigned in his stead. If you want to look it up, Second Kings, 15th chapter. Shalom reigned for only one month and was slain by Menahem, who assumed the throne and ruled for 10 years. During the reign of Menahem, tiglath pileser Pool, king of Assyria, came up against Israel and, and exacted heavy tribute from the nation. At the death of Menahem, Pekahiah, his son, succeeded him. Pekahiah reigned two years and was slain by, in Samaria by a conspiring captain, Pekah. During the reign of Pekah, tiglath pileser who reigned over Syria for about uh, 20 some odd years, about close to 20 years, began his conquest of northern Israel. During the reign, reign of King Ahaz in Judah, Pekah, the uh, king of Israel, and Rezin, king of Syria, conspired against Judah because Ahaz would not join them in an alliance against tiglath pileser Hosea, that's not the prophet, uh, who became the last king of Israel, conspired against Pekah and slew him. Now that, you know, you can say what you want to about uh, American politics now, but all this uh, killing doesn't go on today, unless, unless you mess with the Clintons, then you, then you may not survive very long. But, uh, but in terms of the political intrigue going on, you can't say it's, it's much different today than it was then. Hosea, Hosea con, uh, also conspired against Salmaneser, king of Assyria, by sending messengers to Egypt for help. Shalmaneser then lay siege against Israel, carrying away many of the people into Assyria as captives. Shalmaneser died during the siege of Samaria and was succeeded by Sargon, who completed the siege. And the city fell to Assyria in 721 B.C. Uh, these, this brief summary of the declining years of Israel will help one to understand better the political situation found by Hosea as he prophesied the doom of his nation and his people. These were trying years of political conniving and intrigue, of anarchy and rebellion, of treachery and murder. <clears throat> God was completely left out of the people's thinking. Can you say it's any different today? The prophet's task was to turn the thinking of the people back to God, but they were too deeply steeped in their idolatry to heed his warning. They had passed the point of no return. They refused to hear. Now, one thing we uh, learned from this, that if there is no uh, faithfulness to God, the political institutions must fail. Eventually they will fail uh, because there's no guiding principle, no uh, constancy of, of uh, virtue or uh, conduct that will sustain the, the political institutions. And who can deny today that especially in the last, uh, I guess, 20 or 30 years, maybe longer than that, where uh, virtue is considered a perversion and perversion is considered a virtue. Things have been just turned uh, upside down. But one thing the Lord did do was send prophets to his people to warn them well, is he sending prophets to us today? Well, yes. We've got it right here. And the fact that we're talking about it now and learning what how God treated those things in times past means that the prophets are still speaking to us. But is it a, a situation where the time is past for redemption? 
the time has passed where people will hear his word and, and heed his word. Well, of course, all I can do is read the words of the prophet. I am not a prophet, and I don't, I don't really know. I don't know if it's too late for us, for the world, any other country. I just don't know. But anyway, getting into uh, chapter 1 of uh, Hosea, the word of the Lord, and that establishes right off the, uh, from the get-go uh, that this is an authoritative writing because it's the word of the Lord. And he came to Hosea, through Hosea, uh, the son of Beery. We don't know who Beery is. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. In the days of Jeroboam, that's the second son of Joash, king of Israel. So we know he's pretty close to where at the time that he was uh, preaching. And of course, from what I read, we know the political situation there in Israel at the time. And even though this is really directed towards Israel, he will have some things to say about uh, Judah also. Now it says, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, so it was not really Hosea speaking, it was the Lord speaking, but it was through the uh, means of this prophet Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now, one thing, if you want to understand the book of Hosea, you've got to understand this uh, situation where uh, Hosea is instructed to take a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. And... And because the land of Israel has committed great harlotry. Now, one thing that did do was make Hosea very understanding of the imagery that God was uh, conveying that Israel had played the harlot. That uh, Israel was, in fact, the, uh, if you don't call it the wife and God the husband. And the wife had committed harlotry. You have to understand this imagery that's being laid out here because it would run through the entire book. And he says, Take yourselves a wife of harlotry. Now, does this mean the wife that he's going to take was a harlot at the time that he took the wife? Well, again, getting back to the imagery or the comparison between this uh, wife of harlotry in, in Israel. Originally, Israel was not a harlot, if you don't call it that. They became that way. And so it's very likely that this wife that he took was not a harlot at the time that he took the wife. Uh, he says the land has committed great harlotry uh, and and you can think of that as spiritual adultery where they uh, departed from the Lord as he says. So he went and took Gomer. Now we don't know anything much about Gomer except that Hosea took Gomer as a wife. The daughter of Diblaim, we don't know who that is, anything about him. And she conceived and bore him a son and there's some speculation of whether or not uh, these children of that uh, Gomer bore were actually Hosea's children. And again, if you consider the image that's being conveyed here, uh, it could very well be that these were not the children of, of uh, Hosea. But anyway, the Lord said, you know, call his name Jezreel. Now, uh, Jezreel is mentioned quite often in the Bible. Uh, quite a few events took place there. And it, it really means uh, God is uh, scattered or God is sown. And uh, it will be that he will 
scatter his people. He says, call his name Jezreel for in a little while I will avenge the blood shed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. Now you can read that in 2 Kings, the uh, 10th chapter, verse 11, but the interesting thing about it, this is uh, what uh, Jehu did was to kill all the children of uh, Ahab, and he was instructed to do that by God, and God commended him for doing it. So what bloodshed is he talking about avenging here? Well, it could be that if you look at all the things that Jehu did, he, he did not do it out of a sense of uh, obedience to God, but out of uh, political ambition. So that may be why the uh, bloodshed that he was instructed to engage in was uh, avenged by God. He said, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day, the day that he just talked about. And I will break the bow of Israel. The bow of Israel is, uh, uh, bow is a, is a war-making tool. And he's going to break that ability of Israel to engage in warfare. And he's going to do it in the valley of Jezreel. Okay, that's just real. And she conceived again, bore a daughter, and God said to him, "Let her name be uh, name, call her name Lo Ruhama. Ruhama, Ruhama, Ruhama just means uh, mercy, but which, when you put a Lo in front of it, means not mercy." He said, "For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel; I will utterly take them away." Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Now Judah will have its day of judgment coming, but it was delayed for about uh, 130 or so years uh, later. But uh, Judah was guilty of a lot of the same things that Israel was guilty of. But anyway, I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by the bow. Again, a bow is an uh, instrument of war. It's not going to be by the bow, by the sword, or battle, by horses or horsemen. That's not the way Judah is going to be saved. It will be God that will do the saving. It will not be by the action of Judah itself. Now, when she had weaned Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son, and God said, Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Ami just means my people, and Lo means not. And that's going to be the case with <coughs> Israel. They're not going to be his people any longer. And he goes on to say, Yet the number of the children of Israel. Uh, shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. And then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come out of the land, and be, uh, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now this is uh, prophetic. Uh, language because uh, both uh, 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 Paul and Peter quote this passage here about uh, you're not my people, you, you're sons of the living God. They both quote that to indicate that the gospel was extended to the Gentiles. So, and if you think about it uh, for a moment, the fact that um, God had rejected Israel, they were no longer his people, and eventually, of course, he rejected Judah, but they were scattered about. You remember the uh, uh, fact that the, the, the uh, apostles talk about 
the uh, the Jews of the, of the dispersion. They were scattered everywhere. And some did come back when during the restoration, but not, not everyone came back. But the fact that they were no longer God's people, and this is obviously talking about the Gentiles, and there'll be another passage later on that's obviously talking about the Gentiles. It places them all on the same level playing field that all people can now be God's people, not just the Jews. So when it says the uh, children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, uh, it shall be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. It's included, including everyone. In verse uh, chapter 2, it says, Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother, and that would uh, have to be the, the nation. Bring charges, if you're talking about, you know, one uh, Gomer and the children <coughs> relating to Israel. Uh, bring charges against your mother. It could be Gomer. It could be the uh, nation of Israel. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, something happened here to Gomer, so he, she's not his wife or her husband. Uh, he, her husband. But the same thing with uh, Israel. Uh, Israel is no longer God's wife, so to speak. Nor is God Israel's husband. Let her put away her halteries from her sight and adulteries from between her breast, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her in a dry ran, uh, land and, and slay her with thirst. So she would be exposed as in the day. Uh, before she became the uh, people of God, and she should become like a wilderness, barren, desolate, uh, like a dry land. It's going to be thirsty. It's going to be a bad time for her. In verse 4, it says, I will not have mercy on her children, for they are children of harlotry. Now, Hosea may be getting the idea from what God is telling them that these three children are not really his, that they are actually children of harlotry. And so were the people of Israel. They were children of harlotry also. For their mother, in this case the nation, for their mother has played the harlot, and she who conceived them has done shamefully. Israel went after the... Uh, idols. She committed a spiritual adultery with the idols and so that was a shameful uh, event for she said and again think of Israel I will go after my lovers that's the idols who give me bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink but the idols didn't really do that. The uh, Israelites were just claiming that these idols did that. They couldn't. Idols couldn't do that because they're non-entities. They couldn't do it. But that just gives you an indication of the uh, spiritual adultery that in which they had engaged, that they ascribed these blessings, and, and you have to say they were blessings, describe these blessings to a non-entity, an inanimate, inanimate object, a thing that could not do anything. Therefore, in verse 6, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in, so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Because they don't exist. 
they don't have the power to provide anything. There's, there's no uh, uh, solace to be found in these idols. They can't do anything. He goes on to say in verse 8, I will go and return. When she said, then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now, for she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Now, this returning to her first husband, of course, that was uh, God, was a superficial returning. They were not really serious about it. They just considered, well, we tried the idols. That didn't work, so we'll just let, you know, let's, let's try God. Maybe that'll work, not really believing that uh, he provided all these things, but he did provide the grain, the new wine, and oil, and silver and gold. But they used these things in their devotion to Baal. They prepared them for Baal. And they did not give credit to God for it. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in this time, and my new wine in this season. I will take back my wool, my linen, and give them to cover her nakedness. So all these blessings are going to be taken away. And indeed they were when they were taken away into captivity. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. So everything that's associated with their worship is going to be taken away. Anything that gave them pleasure is going to be taken away. And nobody is going to prevent this from happening. They can't prevent it. Nobody can prevent it, can prevent it because it's from the hand of God. So we'll take up next time here in verse uh, 12 of chapter 2. Thank you.